So I grew up in a small little house, and we had our living room with the TV and the dining room and the couch all in one little space. And right off of that was my brother. My, I had an older brother. It was our bedroom. And our bedroom was actually the porch converted into a bedroom. You know what I'm talking about? Right? It was the porch converted into a bedroom. So whatever was going on in the living room when we went to bed, we heard everything. Okay? And once in a while, more often than I liked growing up, my parents would watch what they considered music in the arts, which was PBS. It was an opera or a symphony orchestra that they would watch. And I just remember as a little boy sitting in my bed, there was no ear pods to drown out any noise at this time. I just remember like this, trying to fall asleep, like, oh, like, it was noise to me. Fast forward years in my early 20s, one of my aunts was visiting from Italy, and she loves the arts, especially in, in this, because arts is a, is a very diverse topic and field. So, but she loves it. So I took my parents and my aunt to New Haven to go see the New Haven Orchestra. And it was my first time ever going live to one of these, you know, outside of the school band that tried, you know. So I sat down in this tight little, have you ever been to the to New Haven, tight, acoustics are perfect, but tight wooden seat sitting there in this big orchestra, all the different instruments. I don't know if it was 30, 40, 50 pieces, but just so diverse And they began to play, right? And the conductor, the maestro, sitting there like some of that, right there. And he just begins to lead them in this orchestra. And I sat there at first with my arms crossed, uncomfortable, listening. And then it just drew me in. And before I knew it, I was like hooked just listening, emotional tears coming to my eyes, like trying to make sure my parents weren't noticing this emotional experience I was having as all these instruments just chimed in at different times. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard and experienced. To me, this is the definition, or this is what the divine balance looks like, okay? Bishop last week spoke about a divine balance as us as the church, as us as believers coming together of living with the power of God underneath the rulership and the order of God coming together. Because in this orchestra, Minister Jason, you in here? No, Minister Jason's not in here. He probably taking care of, no, his boy's right there. I don't know where Minister Jason is, okay? (laughs) He just, okay, but Minister Jason's classically trained and played in, in these types of things. My question is, I think it's much more difficult, more pieces you add to a team. Okay, so if we get Minister Jason up here by himself playing on the keyboard, he could probably do that without any practice, because he's practicing, he can just come. But once this band comes in here behind him, he's got to practice. Now, if we want to put 50 pieces behind him, guess what? It's a whole different stratosphere of now for that to... And here's the thing, which I realized is more of them coming together in this perfect order, following Right, this symphony written by whoever the composer was from 400 years ago from Vienna, and they're playing it, and they have all these. Int- I mean, I saw the drummer just like not even a drummer, because when I think of drummer, I think of that. He just has like one thing, and he's just waiting there. <laughs> he's just waiting there. He's sitting there for like an hour, and I'm like, when is this dude gonna play? And then he finally gets to, and he's boom, 
and the power of it just resonates throughout the place and you get goosebumps. Am I just, does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? But the work, the determination of taking that, coming together, it amplifies the power of them individually when they come together. So when they do this together, that symphony is so much more powerful than if that drummer or what, I'm sorry, I'm killing this because I don't know the proper names of the instruments. If that person that plays that one drum with that one club, right? Club. I'm sorry, Garrett. <laughs> Where's Garrett? At? I'm, I'm sorry. You know, it's not a club. It's not a stick either. What is it? There we go. A mallet. Okay. If he invited me to come, us to go see him play, he might kill it. And it might be pretty good. It might last a couple minutes. But okay, that was pretty good. But when he goes and plays with that symphony, it's just at a whole nother level. This is the divine, right, balance. Balance isn't sexy. That's not a, is that a sexy word? Is that like... Yo, we're going to talk about balance. He's like, well, sign me up. I want me some balance in my life. Come on. Like that's, you know, it's like, dude, you got to, come on, man. Go take a marketing class. Come up with a different name. You know, because it's not sexy. It's not inviting. But it's so true. I then think about that one drummer with the mallet sitting in practice with the orchestra for hours and hours as he sits there and they're like focusing on the violin players and the cello players and all of this and he's sitting through there part of the team just putting his work in because he knows he's part of that bigger stronger good and here's the thing the sound the sound of the orchestra coming together it's beautiful, powerful, it's moving, it's inspirational. That's us, the church, coming together. That's the divine balance. And that's why, even though it might not be sexy, this is who we are. This is who we are as a believer in Christ. This is who we are as part of the body of Christ. And this is who we are as part of kingdom life for this house of what God is calling us to be. This is our culture. This is our DNA. This is what we stand for. This is what we're going to fight for. So, and this is not what I'm preaching about. So I encourage you, if you were not here last week, Listen to that message. If you were here last week, listen to that message again. Dig in. Rip it apart. Start meditating and studying the word and truly allowing it to be part of who you are, part of who we are. Can I get an amen? Amen. So with that being said, I want to talk today about something that I believe is so crucial. It's at the core of us truly living out this calling we, are, we have as part of the body and as part of this house. And the message today is going to be called the seed of the spirit. The seed of the spirit because just like that orchestra, in order for them to work together, they gotta deal with each other, right? For us as a family, some people are telling me like, oh, Marco, you've been married for almost 10 years. Oh, you having a kid? Now you're really gonna be married. Now you, your marriage is gonna start. You know that some people laugh because you think that's funny. I don't think that's funny. I've been married for... <laughs> I've been married for 10 years, okay? But I get it. They're like, man, you know, another one's going to really, it's going to be more difficult. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, and if you have two, it gets even more difficult, right? If you have eight, guess what? 
right? It becomes a little bit more skillful and difficult just to serve dinner, never mind all the other things, okay? That's the thing. So for us, whenever you try to mobilize and bring together, because God, just like that orchestra, wants to bring the power and the order together, it becomes more difficult. The flesh rises up. Our personalities, our backgrounds, our perceptions, our feelings, okay, our understandings, okay, our history, all this stuff, and we now have to deal through it. It's not easy. And Paul understood this. Paul didn't just understand it. This is what he dealt with over and over and over again as he was working with the churches that he started throughout Europe and Asia Minor and in the Middle East over there that he was dealing with strife, with conflict, with all these things going on. So today I want to talk a little bit about that because it's crucial for us to live out the divine balance. So with that being said, turn to Galatians 5. We're going to talk a little bit about life in the Spirit, talk about the fruit of the Spirit. I only have about 20 minutes more with you, so I'm going to just plant some seed here for you to hopefully build on and get into. Before I get into and start with Acts 19, I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to start in 13. This is what Paul says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. I can just talk about this one scripture for the next 20 minutes of how important love is and also how the the devouring of one another. I mean, we look at our culture today and we see this as ringing true. I mean, I was heartbroken last night and this morning to read and find out about another shooting. Five more dead, 20 injured, and it's like, throw up both my hands like Marvin Gaye and shout, what's going on? It's like, what is going on? Biting, devouring one another because this love is absent. It's twisted. This love is perverted. But when we go to the scripture, we realize the entire law is summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So why is this important? I wrote here that love is the summing up, not merely of the law, but of all true spiritual life. Love is the summing up of not just the entire law, but of our entire spiritual life. Let me explain. You guys know what the Trinity is? It's what? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God in one. Three persons in one. Let me explain this, right? So you have God, correct? Then over here you have Jesus, and then over here you have the Holy Spirit. Now, if they are three but one, if God is love, then what is Jesus? And then what is the Holy Spirit? See, we need to get this. Let me, let me explain it as elementary as I can, and I'm I don't want St. Augustine to turn in his grave as I share this, but let me just bring it in an elementary way. I think of the Trinity as water, okay? Water is one thing, correct? But it comes in three forms. We have liquid water, Father God. And then we have ice, right? The solid form, Jesus, 
coming to this earth, love in a solid form. And then we have vapor, the Holy Spirit. All three of them are made up of the same thing, which is what? Which is H2O, which is water. So what I'm telling you today is just like that. That's how we understand the Trinity and how love is in all three of those things. Because Father God is love. Right? So if he's the liquid water, H2O is who he is. The whole makeup of water is what? H2O. That, so God is love. The makeup of God is love. That's it. There's no other things. Oh, and he's this, 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 and this. All that comes under, all of it comes under love. So then if it changes form and that same love, that same God comes in bodily form, when we saw Jesus, we saw Love in person, love acting out, love, perfect love demonstrated for us on this earth. The most amazing thing ever. He lived it out for us. He didn't just teach about it. He was love. And when he said, love lays down their lives for one another, he went on the cross and did it. Love. But then when he went on that cross and died, and he said it was finished, what did he do? The temple broke. The veil split in half, which was representative of the Spirit of God. It broke forth and now was free through Christ Jesus that all of us have this deposit, have this seed of the Spirit, which is Love, which is love. It's in all of us. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's love. So when I talk about God and God's love, I'm talking about Jesus and Jesus' love. I'm talking about the Spirit and the Spirit of love. So whenever we see this, it's together. It's not separating. Oh, God is love, but Jesus is this, and the Holy Spirit, no, no. It's love. So if you don't remember anything else after today, as you leave here, it's love. That's why Jesus said, you could give all your money away, right? You can throw your body to the flames, but if you do it without love, you're nothing. He said, you can now act out just like I am, but if you do it without love, you are nothing. And he said, man, you can prophesy and do miraculous signs, but if you do it without love, because here's the thing, if I took H2O out of ice, what am I left with? It ceases to be ice. If I take it out of steam and vapor, what do I have left? Dirt. I have death. I have nothing. So there's no way to take love out of the Spirit of God. There's no way to take love out of Jesus. There's no way to take love out of God and say you still have God. And say we still are flowing the Spirit. To say we're still under Christ Jesus because we're violating the very thing that God is, that the Trinity is. Am I making sense? Does this, does this resonate with us? See, this is something we need to dig into. We need to get into the Word. We need to get this to be part of us to where nothing matters. That's why when Paul said, nothing can separate me from God's love. No height, no debt, no Jew, not slavery, not poverty, not famine, not war, not injustice, nothing. Nothing in this world can separate me from this love. That's why when he was in jail, dying in he was filled with the joy of the Lord that he could write these epistles to us encouraging us to continue on with the love of God how does he do that while he's falsely imprisoned for serving God 
in a jail cell, rotting away and knowing he will never see freedom again, but knowing he is more free than anybody else in the world. Amen. This is the gospel. This is the God we confess. This is what Christ did at the cross. This is the spirit that's coming in and out of our lungs. So with that, let's read on. Okay. So Galatians 16 talks about this beautiful struggle. Paul tells us we are battling between the sinful nature and the spirit of God, right? Life in the spirit, life in the flesh. We are right there. He says in verse 16, so I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Let's just stop right there. Live by the Spirit, a choice. He's telling us, when you get up and leave for work today, live by the Spirit. Make that choice. Live by the Spirit. And then he says, and you got to catch this, and you will not gratify, right? You will not gratify the desires. He didn't say you won't have desires, He doesn't say you won't have desires. He says you won't gratify the (laughs) sinful flesh desires that you're going to have. Oh, not me. Oh, no, I'm a pastor. Baby, I don't have no sinful desires. It's just all pure. (laughs) It's a lie. Now, there's different measures, but every single one of us should identify to the desires of the sinful nature. We've either been lost and bound in them, or even when we were set free through Christ Jesus by grace, we still struggle with them. They still are part of us. So what do we do? That's why humility is so important for us. I do not understand your life fully. I don't understand the complexities of it. I don't understand what you went through, what you've been through, what you're going through. I don't understand the fullness of all that, that made you, you, distinctively who you are, and the struggles, and the beauty, and everything that encapsulates you. But I know one thing, You're in this beautiful struggle just like me. And since I need grace, you need grace. That's why I need to be humble. We all need to have humility towards one another. And just like God, by grace, if you read Galatians, it's a book about the grace of God. How Christ set us free by his grace, not by our works, not by who we are or what we've done, just by The love of God through grace, we are redeemed. And because of that, I now need to be gracious with you, as you are with me, as you are with your child, as your child should be with their school teacher, as a school teacher should be with their class, so on and so forth. All throughout humanity, this needs to be what we champion, what we realize as a truth of humanity instead of biting and devouring on social media with our friends, talking junk and this and that about this and having opinions about this. Listen, I know just by giving examples of things in the culture, I can lose some of you guys because, oh, he's that. Oh, he's this. So I'm not even going to give examples of the culture. Okay, I'm not going to do it. You're not going to suck me in. (laughs) Not going to do it. But know this, I have grace towards everybody. Not that I am so gracious, but that's my heart. I don't care who it is. Now you can say, well, you haven't gone through what I've, I get that. 
but I'm just going based on what Christ did for us and what he calls us to do. So I stand on it by faith. I declare it by faith, not because I know I can be gracious and humble in all things and extend that type of love towards you no matter what. No, it's the absolute opposite of it. It's because I know I won't. I know that I have a criticalness in me. I know I can be controlling. I know I have an opinion about everything. I know I could easily put you in a box if the Holy Spirit doesn't work in me. Is it not alive in me? If that seed of the Spirit from when I was saved that was put in me, if I do not nurture it and cultivate it for it to grow, I realize I'm no good. So even at the very least, by faith, I'm gracious. By faith, we should be that way towards one another. And the Bible says, especially towards who? Our enemies. Jesus said, man, what good is it, man, that a father does it to their own son? You being evil, you can do that. But no, no, I'm calling you to love your enemies. What? So I haven't even got to the fruit of the Spirit yet. So then Paul breaks down the acts of the sinful nature. I want to read these to you. I'm not going to break them down, but I want you to hear. Now, this is not an all-encompassing list. There's a lot more acts of the sinful nature, unfortunately, right? So in verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. The root word for witchcraft comes from the same root word as pharmacy or pharmaceutical, meaning drugs. Okay, so we talk about witchcraft, talking about taking drugs, and okay, just to tie it in together, just so you're like, witchcraft, I don't do any of that. Uh, Okay, (laughs) so let's continue. Hatred. Now, Now this starts to hit home because when we think about the sinful nature, we automatically think of breaking laws and stuff we would go to jail for. Murder robbing, all of these things. But that's not what Paul does, even though some of those things are in here. He also breaks out hatred, discord, jealousy, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, look at dissensions, factions. Oof, I can't even touch that one. I'll burn myself, okay? Envy drunkenness, orgies and the like. In the King James, when it says envy, it says envy and murder. It ties envy with murder. And if you think that's too far of a stretch, what was the first murder on the, in, on the world? Cain and Abel. Why did Cain murder Abel? Envy, jealousy, it's real. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's the thing. This isn't because there's this rule checklist. You know, we think of God like he's Santa Claus, right? Checking the list twice, you know, seeing who's naughty, who's nice. Oh, you're naughty. Hell for you. You're no- oh, you did this when you were 12 years old. Hell. Listen, if that's your view of God, why are you here? You know, God is love. If we live this way, we reject God. God doesn't reject us. Does that make sense? So it's not that God's saying, oh, now you don't inherit the kingdom of God. No, it's us saying we don't want the kingdom of God. We want to do what makes us happy. We want to do what this flesh of mine And Paul calls this flesh not sin. He calls it nature, sinful nature, meaning it's who we are. And if it's left unchecked, it brings discord, factions, envy, murder, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, and all this other stuff. So it's not a bunch of rules of what not to do, It's Paul saying, ready? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is 
no law. Man, there is no law. That statement is like the bomb being set off in the room. Why? Because when we operate in the fruit of the Spirit, we're mature in Christ. We've matured in Christ Jesus. The seed of the Spirit from salvation that was put in us is now growing. It's now being cultivated. I'm not praying to God, God, give me more patience. God isn't going to just zap us with more patience. God isn't going to just zap us with more self-control. He wants us to grow and to mature. How have you grown and matured in anything in your life? Spiritually, we got to apply the same principles. Did you just start to speak because God gave you more words to speak? Or did it start from a mama and a daddy? that read to you, up, you pee, up. I'm already starting, practicing, okay? No, and oh, right? So, listen to this. I want to read to you in the Passion Translation for Galatians 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. See, it's love. This seed in you, it's love. It's God. It's Christ in you, the Spirit of God. And now, as it matures and grows and produces fruit, it produces all of these. Let me continue. Joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, which is goodness, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of the spirit, which is self-control. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Oh. See, sometimes I feel like we treat the fruit of the Spirit like we do the gifts of the Spirit. Because we can make a true statement in saying, listen, I have this gift, but not this one. Okay, so that's, I don't interpret tongues like others do, but I have an administrative gift. And that's okay. We can't say the same thing when it comes to the fruit. We can't say, oh, God has given me more patience, but self-control he hasn't given me yet. (laughs) Wrong. The truth is, All of them should be maturing in us. And if they're not, it's because of how we're cultivating the very spirit within us. So if I don't have patience, it isn't because God hasn't allowed it to come forth in me. And it isn't because I just don't have it. It's because I'm not prioritizing it. I'm not cultivating it. I don't value it in my life. I don't value, and I can tell you right now, I don't value self-control that much. I'll tell you what I think, when I think, how I think it, I eat what I want, when I want, I'll stay up, I'll miss sleep. Listen, self-control, weakness. Okay? I don't know what yours is. I feel like a lot of you might be self-control also. Okay? That's just me. That's what I think. I think we all can check like, yeah, God. Okay, but I'm not going to God saying, God, give me more self-control. Okay, because then I pray that, and then my wife walks home, you know, from her parents' house with a plate of apple turnovers. (laughs) At 9 o'clock at night, I'm like, "Mm." (laughs) (laughs) self-control. Okay, and God's like, eh, (laughs) failed again. (laughs) All right, it's real. 
that's practical. Romans 12, 1, I love it, especially in the message transversion, tra translation. It says, take your ordinary, everyday life and bring it to God. How do we cultivate this? Bring your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're waking up, you're going to work, you're eating, you're watching TV, you're, you're snapping, you're tweeting, you know, your Instas, just all of it. You're dressing, you're thinking, just bring it all. So, let me close with this. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13. Bishop last week talked about the fivefold ministry, right? What's the role of the fivefold ministry? In verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ, I love this, because it says the body of Christ, not the individual alone. We always got to be thinking community. That's why we need to plug in to community whether it's organic and you do it naturally, or if you need it, you need to go online today and sign up for it. But it says, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's the goal. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's who God wants us to be. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be imitators of him. He wants us to mature. He wants the seed, where he even says that mustard seed can tell the mountain to be moved if you just have that faith of a mustard seed, but realizing that mustard seed needs to grow and bear fruit, and it can grow into a giant powerful, strong. We need to grow. And going back to what I started from the beginning, let me just tell you, read this scripture to you. This is Jesus. He says, a new command I give you, love one another, right? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says this, and this should, this is the mic drop. If I had it, maybe I'll just rip this off my head after, I'm, after I say this, Okay. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you give away all your money. If you serve nonstop. If you prophesy and speak like angels. No, it doesn't say any of that. What does it say? They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world needs to see us loving them. The world will know we're his disciples by the way we love. Are we willing to cultivate the seed of the Spirit, the seed of love that God gave us through Christ Jesus through the ups and downs, through the mistakes, and mature and bear fruit to produce something that the world will take notice of. I don't know about you, that's what I want. That's what this church wants. That's what we want. Amen? Stand up with me. We're going to pray. Can you be honest with God? Can you come to him as we pray right now and lay those things at his altar? Can you lay down the envy, the discord, the drunkenness, the lustful thoughts, the impurities, Can you give it to God with humility, with repentance, 
Say, God, I need to grow in you. We need to grow in you. We want to be the church. We want to be your disciples. We want the world to see salt and light for real. They will know us by our, your love. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Lord God, we're not perfect. We never will be. We don't fully grasp or even understand what love is. The full measure of it. It's baffling. It's unmeasurable. It's incredible. It doesn't stop. We want to be in. So Lord God, search our hearts. Search my heart. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my judgment. Forgive me for my discord. Forgive me for my lustful thoughts, Lord God. Forgive us all of gratifying the sinful nature that through this freedom through Christ we keep on living through this nature, this sinful nature that disrupts, that breaks apart. Lord God, we want to bear your fruit. We want to produce your love in all its various forms through us. So Lord God, forgive us, heal us, and let us truly from this day dig into it and see the ways we can cultivate and grow this love that you have given us. We speak it and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. We truly do love you.